pleasure to Great. welcome you yeah. to yeah, I'd love it. our study of the letter of Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3. We concluded chapter 2 last week, and now we will begin this evening, as is our custom, by reading the, through the entire text of the chapter together in unison. So let's begin with verse 1. Therefore, Therefore if you have been, been raised up with Christ, Christ Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with the Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, regard the members of your earthly body as dead and fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the children of disobedience. And in them you also walked when you were living in them. But now you also put all these aside, Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and all abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on a new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. A renewal in which there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, skin, slave or free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so much you also do. And over all these put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in, in all things obey those who are masters of the earth, not with mere external service only, as those who please men, but with serenity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do from your heart, as unto the Lord, rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For the one who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong, which that one has done, and that without partiality. This is uh, quite... Uh, a lot here for us to unpack uh, this evening. And so uh, uh, I'll begin with the first one and we will uh, begin with our commentary on the text. And please, at any moment, if you have an inspiration, a flash of insight, um, please don't hesitate to contribute. Um, and also if you have questions, uh, because this is something we're doing together. Um, so, uh, continuing from what Paul was addressing in the second chapter, the second chapter was 
uh, and the first chapter were much more theological. Uh, when I say that, Paul is dealing with ideas. We, uh, in the first chapter, we get uh, the Christological hymn in which Paul um, uh, speaks about what we would call Christology. That's an area of theological inquiry. In the second chapter, we begin to see why Paul was emphasizing uh, the centrality of Christ because there were some false teachings that were creeping up in the communities of the Lycus River Valley, which were three cities, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. And we discussed, we tried to decipher what it is, what were the nature of these false teachings. And, um, and we realized that there were various currents of religious and philosophical thinking, if you can separate the two, that were um, widely disseminated uh, throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. There was the, the classical religion of the Greeks and Romans, which pretty much were exhausted and bankrupt um, because civilization had developed and human thought had developed to the point that even they thought the stories of the gods were foolish. Then um, you had um, the rise of the mystery religions, the influence of Persian religion, Zoroastrianism, and you had the influence of Greek philosophy, uh, and this mixture uh, of these ideas um, produced a phenomenon called Gnosticism. And it's called Gnosticism by scholars. They didn't call themselves Gnostic, but the reason they're called Gnostics or their systems were called Gnosticism because the key word they used was possessing secret knowledge, special knowledge, secret passwords that you may pass up through the levels of angelic beings. And so you, you have Paul speaking to these kinds of things and he's warning them, oh, and then added to the mix was Judaism, certain aspects of Judaism. And asceticism, the practice of punishing the body in order to grow spiritually, and, um, and also following many of the rules and regulations of, of Judaism. And these were all mixed up together like a fruit punch. Like they were, all the stuff was thrown into a blender. <laughs> um, we do have, this is a phenomenon that we call syncretism. Now, syncretism is different than, say, as Catholic Christians, we can look at other world religions and appreciate the truth that is contained in them th therein. We can learn from them. We can appreciate them. But we have to be careful that we always make the distinction of what is Catholicism or what is Christianity as opposed to what is Buddhism or Hinduism. And as long as we make those distinctions and we know what our own identity is in Christ, then I think it's fine for us to, to be in dialogue with re other religious traditions. So dialogue and, and an openness to other people's worldviews and ideas is useful to all of us. But syncretism is a different matter altogether. Syncretism is where you just kind of take all the religions and you ignore the uniqueness of each and you just kind of put them all together and blend them up and you create kind of a, a, a mishmash. And the problem is, uh, rather than giving you greater insight, um, is that you diminish the value of any religious tradition by doing that. You've really created another thing altogether. Um, the closest thing in our own day to syncretism um, that I've observed in the last 20, 25 years is a, um, it can be grouped together under the heading New Age. Hmm. New Age is not systematic. There's not like one system of thought or a particular tradition. Uh, New Age religion seems to borrow anything from any religion and give it, and give it a, a new interpretation. And, uh, and, and so it can be uh, self-contradictory, it can be confusing, and um, 
and, and uh, to me, it would be very exhausting to pursue that path. I have, I have yet to uh, become, uh, to master Christianity, let alone everybody else's religion, and mixing them all together seems to be confounding and confusing. Um, so Paul is basically in the second chapter addressing that situation and uh, warning the Colossian Christians, in particular, uh, against being taken captive by uh, fancy philosophical arguments or esoteric religious practices. Now, the professor of comparative religion, do you have anything you want to add to that? Does that, that stimulate like your thinking about anything? <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I didn't know if you were uh, ready to. I think it's important to recognize that we can see elements in other religions that are very similar to practices and ideas that we find in Christianity. Yeah. And I think that's important. For example, in Buddhism, they emphasize getting rid of the self and the ego. And I think that no, that notion of emptying is very important in Christianity um, before we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So the emptying of the self, the ego self, has to take place. Yeah. And then to be filled with the Holy Spirit, well, Buddhism has the emptying, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So uh, it, it uh, the whirly dervishes in Islam uh, practice union with God through love. Mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously very akin to what goes on in, in Christianity. But that's not mainstream Islam. The people who were uh, Sufis have frequently gotten into trouble with the authority in, in Islam. So we can find similarities, but um, as Christians we find the whole package in Christianity. It dilutes it when you... Uh, when you add too many ingredients. I'm so glad that you found the word. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love that because that's exactly what syncretism does. Syncretism at first seems very attractive because you're just bringing it all together, but you're diluting. Um, the, the, uh, and, and so you will act actually begin to obscure anything of value from any of the religious systems that you're bar drawing from. Um, now, there are uh, Catholicism, I mean, in Christianity in general, there has been two approaches historically. When Christianity encounters another culture, um, and, uh, and that other culture means another religious system that is present there, one approach has been to be very um, hostile to that culture and to that religious system and to try to eradicate it and replace it with Christianity as we understand it. The other way uh, stream in, in, um, in Christianity it, when it encounters thought is to not eradicate the culture but to transform it and look at those things that are worthy of redemption. So if there is a religious practice, say, in a given culture, that's really a positive religious practice, well, we don't have to eradicate it. We can, we can baptize it and bring it in. And um, both approaches have happened at one time or another, sometimes both simultaneously. If, if someone has grown up with a certain belief system, it is easier for them to do an overlay yeah. and make a new understanding than it is to erase the way yeah. they always thought. Um, years ago, I was in Peru, and the Indians obviously practice Catholicism and Christianity, but they have the Jesus of the harvest and the Jesus of the sun and the Jesus of the moon, so that's yeah. how they bring their myth to um, support their understanding of, of the Christ story. Yeah, and, and so they assimilate it. Yes. And Christianity can assimilate these things. So, uh, and I think Catholicism has been particularly ingenious 
and being able to do that. Sometimes it has not always worked out well. Some, there has been some, for lack of a better word, pagan or alien religious practices or thoughts that get, that penetrate into Christianity and, and that creates problems that have to be dealt with. But one classic example is, is what happened in the history of Christianity at the very beginning. The major cultural religious world that the Christians encountered, because the Christians were Jewish, was the Greek world, the Hellenistic world. And eventually, after, so many, after a few centuries, uh, Greek civilization was effectively Christianized. It was Christianized. However, Christianity was also Hellenized. Uh, we took on some of the features and contributions of, of Greek culture, the great philosophical system. So much of theology in the church was the result of this encounter with Greek philosophy and Greek uh, philosophical categories of thought and Christianity. And, and, and so uh, theologians would uh, spend Generations of theologians would work on creating a synthesis of this because all truth is God's truth. And um, a great example of this is the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, a brilliant mind, a giant intellect. He would have been a giant intellect in any age he would have lived, like a Stephen Hawking or an Einstein. But the problem in his time and this is in the high Middle Ages, in the time that we call, uh, in that century called the 13th century, uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, came on the scene just when the Western Latin Christian Western world, Western Europe, was now coming into contact with the writings of Aristotle, which were lost to the West. And it, it came through the Arab scholars. The Arabs translated uh, Aristotle into Arabic, and of course the Arab culture was dominant in Spain. And through that, uh, the, the, the thought of Aristotle and the writings of Aristotle was starting to become available and people were beginning to talk about it. It was exciting, it was also controversial, and it was threatening to the status quo. Because up until that time, the Latin church was predominantly um, um, Platonic because of Augustine. Augustine um, philosophically was more, had more affinity with Plato and um, Plotinus, which is called the Neoplatonists. And so that affected his thought. Aristotle also became to the notice of the Europeans because as the Muslims were conquering Byzantium, uh, the Greek church, those Greek scholars were coming into the West and they also brought in the writings of Aristotle. So this created a renaissance in, um, in Latin scholasticism, but it was also a collision of worldviews. It seemed as though Aristotelian thought, which was intellectually very attractive, was going to be a threat to Christianity. Uh, it was a challenge to Christianity. And so what happened, and the genius of, uh, of Thomas Aquinas is, he understood Aristotelianism, he understood classical Christianity, and he created that theological system that synthesized them together. It wasn't syncretism, he Christianized Aristotle. But at the same time, the theological orientation of Christianity became Aristotelian. That's where you get the idea of transubstantiation. That's an Aristotelian philosophical category of thought. It's based on that. So, uh, but we survived as Christians, Christian civilization in the West survived the challenge of Aristotelianism because we were able to absorb it and the brilliance of, Aris, uh, of uh, Thomas Aquinas was that he was able to create a system so that the two ways of thinking could be reconciled with one another and continue on. 
We're experiencing the same thing today in the modern world. People have this, feel like science is a challenge to faith. You hear about science and faith, it's an either or. But what we're experiencing in our day is that you have both scientists and theologians working together to meet this challenge. And we're finding that there is a, the work of synthesizing the truths of both approaches to reality. We're finding that. Because these things, truth is one, so these things don't have to be contradictory. Um, we can learn about evolution and we're able to synthesize that with what we as Christians believe that God is behind it all. He's the creator. I'm looking to you because you taught philosophy. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, Aristotle, when, when he was rediscovered in the West and those works were translated from Arabic, they, they had been in um, the Greek language and they were translated into Arabic and then from Arabic they're tr translated in Spain into Latin because in Spain, Christian and Jewish and Islamic scholars work together for quite a period of time. Yeah. And that's very important. Um, when Aristotle was reintroduced into Western culture, uh, he was called the philosopher uh, by everybody, which is pretty much akin these days to being called the scientist because the physical sciences used to be called or the natural sciences used to be called natural philosophy. It was called philosophy into the 1800s. And then the, the way we categorize what's going on in what we call science today shifted and they quit calling it natural philosophy and it becomes natural science. But um, Aristotle was very interested in the material world. Plato wasn't. Yeah. You know, topics for, for what I could talk about sometime. Um, and so uh, Aristotle was wrong about a whole lot of stuff, but he was doing basic biology, he was doing basic physics. He probably at the time that he lived knew the most of any human being who was alive. And um, those ideas carry on into the Middle Ages and are partly responsible for some of the beginnings of what we ended up calling modern science because <laughs> he was interested in the material world. And uh, Christians slowly start testing, empirically testing things that he said and discover <laughs> that he was wrong. And that's gonna lead to Galileo and it's gonna lead to a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, well thank you, that, that, that's great. So. I, I just bring these up as examples of what... Well, I wanted to give you an oh. example, my favorite example okay. of, of how culture, how uh, an existing culture is adapted uh, by Christianity. My favorite example of that is the Christmas tree. Because mm -hmm. Nordic cultures would drag in an evergreen tree in the middle of the winter, and eventually it becomes a Christian custom. It wasn't originally a Christian custom. And who started it? The Nordics? It was in, in Northern Europe okay. that they would do this. Yeah, yeah among the, the pre-Christian cultures. The pre-Christian uh, cultures. Did it have to do with the new year coming? It, was that why they did it? It had to do with the renewal of the earth because they were in the middle of winter. Oh. And they, you know. Okay. The winter solstice. Which bring is, things in in order to get the, the light year. to come back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's a good example of something, a practice that people liked. It's a custom. And we just brought it into Christianity. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. We, we baptized that practice. That's right. Made it our own. And when Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas and don't bring in Christmas trees, it's because they regard this as a pagan, yeah. or a pagan custom yeah. that oh. we ought not to have anything to do with. Oh. But they ignore the fact that we changed the meaning. We gave it a Christian meaning, so now it's okay. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask Diane a quick question? Yeah, we'll go right ahead. That relates back to what we were talking about last week. The end of the second chapter, they're talking about in uh, 
this uh, interpretation, rulers and authorities. Christ is over the rulers and authorities. They have to get behind them in line. Christ has superseded them. They're no longer your, uh, anything to be listened to. And, and my uh, Jerusalem Bible refers to them as principalities and sovereignties. And we understood these to be some sort of class of angels or demigods. Yeah. And where does Paul get this? Because I, I did some reading a little bit and he said this was an early Christian idea that there were classes of angels. So he's writing about these rulers and authorities or principalities and sovereignties. Where does that come from? Is that Greek or is it? Just off the top of my head, I think it, it sounds a little bit like the myth that you find in Gnosticism, which I okay. could yeah. don't draw a big giant diagram of that whole thing, but um, that's where, I mean, I would tend to go there. Yeah. Okay. So it was one of those things floating around yeah. Yeah, at the time around. of Paul, but then it, it, it got involved in early Christianity where they started applying well, this thing to classes of angels? Well, the, the, the Jews had classes of angels. Okay. And they used that kind of language to refer to different ranks of angelic beings. And so it, it's kind of out of that mix of Greek ideas, Judaism, and then Christianity. And then eventually you get the Christian belief of the nine choirs, levels of angels. Mm -hmm. Beginning with uh, cherubim, yeah. seraphim, right. Right. archangels, and all the way down uh, the line. And I gave a handout describing that. I'll have to get it to you. I think I, like, I gave it out the night week you were away. Well, yeah. no, I, I understand that, but I, what I didn't understand was how Paul was referring to that. Yeah. Because Paul, I mean, you know, Paul is, you know, these choirs of angels came that, Later. Yeah, that, that predates, yeah. He pre, Paul predates that formal system of scheme uh, that was developed. In, in Gnosticism, you have the, the highest uh, deity, the, the, the true absolute deity. And then there are emanations of lesser deities, which could be some of these, which control different things. That could be your principalities and powers and stuff, and out of that comes Christ. So he's and he comes to Earth to save souls that have been trapped in matter because they're very the Gnostics were very anti-matter in orientation. So the Gnostics are first century prior. Well, going back probably several centuries before first century. And we don't really know where they originated per se, but there's so Jewish there, Gnostics. Well, there, well, there are Gnostics, and then they, yes. and then there are Christian, question, and yeah. then there are Christian Gnostics. So, okay. yeah, so they, the Christian Gnostics pulled in this mythology, and they added Christ to the mixture. Okay. I, and the church I, eventually repudiates repudi Gnosticism. But when not, did they do but, that? But the big problem. Well, there are several big problems, but one of the big problems is they regard the Jewish God, the, the creator deity who creates this world, he's a, he's a much lesser deity than these powers and principalities that, that are emanations from the, the, tr the true God because he creates matter and matter is bad. And that and and souls got trapped in matter that's part of the world that this lesser Jehovah God created. And so Jesus is on a rescue well, yeah, Jesus the Christ is on a rescue mission to get souls torn away from matter and get them back to the to God, to the true God, who is not the, the creator God of the material universe. It so, gets yeah. very complex very fast. But. So they're right. Jewish Gnostics. I, I follow you. What's that? They're Jewish Gnostics. Yes. Gnosticism, they were already by this time Jewish Gnostics before the Christian era. And then it, it and, and then the Gnostic they, ideas would come into Christianity through Gnostic Jews and through Greek, Greek Gnostics, Gnostics who were not right. Jewish. Jewish. Yeah. Um, and so based upon what Paul is saying, because we're always seeing one side of the conversation, in chapter 2, 
we can surmise that this is what Paul is dealing with. This is what he's speaking against uh, by the language he uses. And so in the second chapter, we essentially have Paul's polemic against a kind of Gnosticism, which is uh, manifested in a, a syncretism of all of the different mix of religions that were available to them. Now, at Paul Gatlin. And it's um, because of the, the Gnostic problem is one of the reasons why there's such a emphasis on the bodily resurrection of Jesus, on, on the idea that he was really a, a human body as well as a human soul. And you even see that in the resurrection accounts where the emphasis is that he's not a spirit. He's not a disembodied he's not spirit. A ghost, he's he's not got a, he has flesh and, and bone. He can eat. Yeah. So um, now that Paul has addressed the problem by attacking the, the, these ideas that were now um, um, in, in currency there in, in Col Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, in the third chapter, he's now going to point them in the right direction. So he begins in the first verse, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, because in baptism we died or raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. And then he says, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That just sort of circumvents the whole emanations and all these other things. So all we need to do is to seek Christ. Why? Because it is Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and there we have that connection with the prophecy in Daniel, one like the Son of Man who is at the right hand of the Ancient of Days who sits on the throne and is coming forth from God. So you have um, uh, Christ who is seated at the right hand of God, which means to sit at one's right hand he has God's authority. To be the right hand, usually the right hand, we would think of the right hand of a monarch as the prime minister. And all of the authority of the monarch is now vested in the prime minister, and the prime minister now governs the realm, uh, but the prime minister has received his authority to do that from the monarch. So Paul's using this way of thinking and referring to the relationship of Christ to God. It is as if, Christ, who is the eternal word, is God's prime minister. Through him, God creates all things, which we've seen already in Colossians. Yeah, the very highest authority um, except for the monarch. Yeah. Or the father. So, and, and so, yeah, God being the father is prime, primary, and then you have Christ who has the authority given to him by the Father. That's what this language means, seated at his right hand. Then he's urging the Colossian Christians to say, set your mind on the things above. And what are the things above? Christ. Christ. Not on the things that are on earth. <clears throat> For you have died through baptism, and your life is hidden your real life, your true life, is hidden with Christ in God. So in Christ, positioning in our relationship with God, we too have been exalted with Christ in his ascension. I, I get yeah. this image of uh, Jesus at God's right hand, and then there's all of us who've been baptized, and we're, we're there yeah. over there with Christ too. We so are. We yeah. are a... Uh, a large we well, are Christ's body and, yeah. and we are there also yes so it we Christ is in us that is the mystery the hope of glory Christ is in us and we are in Christ so he says for you have died with Christ that is for reference to the baptism in baptism, we are united in the death of Christ. We are also united in his resurrection. And your life is hidden with Christ and God because the resurrection hasn't yet happened. 
It's, we're still looking forward because we're still in the temporal world. It hasn't happened. But that lo resurrected life already exists within us, but it's hidden. And that life is hidden in Christ. But when Christ, who is our life, is revealed or appears, that's the parousia, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So when Christ comes in glory in the second coming, and he's revealed to the world, we too will be, the, the real life of who we really are will be transformed, and we will be revealed too. That life that is in you, which is immortal, it already is within you. But all I see when I look at you is your mortality. As you look at me, you're seeing me age. Death is at work in this body. It's deteriorating. We're all, we're all terminal. That's how it appears. But at a deeper level, we have been raised from death, and we're actually immortal beings. And so this mortality will fall away, and we will be resurrected And when Christ comes again, and then that real life of who we really are will finally be revealed for all to see. And so each one of us, I may be looking at a mortal when I look at you, and as you're looking at me, but someday you will see me as I really am an immortal, glorified by the power of Christ and the presence of Christ. Isn't that a sweeping vision? Mm -hmm. that, and that's the hope of glory Paul is talking about. The hope is we are anticipating. Mm -hmm. Then, um, then... Can I make a... Yeah, go right ahead. Um, long deep breath, uh, sort of, because Paul thought, as did many of the early Christians, that that revelation and the Prusia would would happen soon. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the first generation Christians, if you would have asked them when they thought Jesus would return, they thought within their own lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it wasn't until much later that it dawned on them, oh, this is going to take a little longer. <laughs> and why did it dawn on them? Because many of the first generation were being put to death. <laughs> so, you know. And, 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 and so now the church was going to be more than just a one generation phenomenon. It was and gonna, the euphemism is um, are asleep in Christ. Yeah. Then in verse 5, therefore, now Paul, Paul makes a transition with this therefore. He's now going to give the practical implications of his theology. And all of a sudden, He's going to become, it seems like, very ethical. He's going to tell us, this is how we're now to live. This being true, all this mystical theology, this is how it should look like in your life. So he says, therefore, since this is true, regard the members of your earthly body, that is your mortal body, as dead. And then he lists these kinds of what we would call vices or sins. Fornication, which is uh, sexual um, sins. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And right there, he really describes how much of human life is experienced. <laughs> People say, look, that's the way the world has become. No, the world is always that way. And greed, which is idolatry. Now, he doesn't say, that when it when says which is idolatry is in the singular and it's referring to the word greed that Paul is using there. It's not referring to that whole list. But it's interesting that Paul defines greed as really idolatry. What is idolatry in the mind of Paul? Idolatry is that which is of your ultimate value in life, what you value most. Um, it, and what you value most becomes the criteria by which you make your decisions in life. And um, so if your highest value in life is material possessions, then every decision you will make in order to be consistent with, 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 with that highest value then is to acquire more wealth, more wealth and more wealth, uh, or whatever it is that you're greedy for. That is idolatry. That's the primary sin from which all other vices flow. 
not necessarily material greed, but idolatry. Whatever you make, your ultimate concern in life will determine the choices that you make. Now, human beings are remarkably inconsistent. Even the most idolatrous person, who let's say if he makes money his ultimate thing, will occasionally show charity, <laughs> you know? And, and even those who will make Christ their ultimate um, concern, their, their, their God, uh, will be inconsistent. So human beings are remarkably inconsistent. But in general, this is the flow of Paul's thought. Verse 6, for it is because of these things, the list of uh, evils that he listed there, that the wrath of God will come upon the children of disobedience. Now the wrath of God, <clears throat> we interpret that as God being angry. And, and because we associate wrath with anger. But the wrath of God is better understood as God's opposition to evil. Good must stand against evil. So wrath is God's opposition to evil. Good must oppose evil. <clears throat> it's God's no to evil. Now, it's kind of built into the universe. And Paul refers to this, what you sow, you will reap. In other words, what is God's wrath? How is it expressed? In allowing, giving us over to the consequences of, of our choice. So it's not like God is, is actively throwing down bolts of lightning at you because you did bad. But God's going to give you up to the consequences of your bad decisions. That's the wrath of God. You want to go down that path? Okay. I explained it to you. That's what I do with my sons, which is a great example. I've told you, and you've ignored me. Okay, I'm not going to stop you. Go out and do that stupid thing, and then see what happens. <laughs> it's kind of a more passive kind of parenting, in the sense of, okay, I'm going to allow you to, to reap um, uh, the fruit of your bad decisions. <laughs> As Paul says into the Galatians, he says um, um, that uh, God is not mocked, mocked. What you sow, you shall surely reap. Isn't there something about the whirlwind and the wind? How's that go, that proverb? He who sows Sows the wind inherits the inherits the whirlwind. <laughs> Inherit the wind. Yeah. yeah. So think of wrath in terms of something that is um, God has built into the universe that there will be consequences to evil action. Some people in another religion, although it's very different, uh, understood in very different ways, it's kind of like karma. Karma is like that, the cycle of if you do something. What goes around comes around. <laughs> okay. It's very Celtic also. Yeah. Very circular. Yeah. yeah. And notice when Paul's developing the idea of wrath in the first chapter of Romans. Remember, yeah. he, they decided to worship. The first thing they did was worship the creation rather than the creator. And so God gave them over. God, Because they did that, God gave them over. Which, in other words, he allowed that to happen. Okay. <clears throat> then he says, um, verse 7, And in them you also once walked. You're not exempt from this because before you believed, you, walked, you lived that way, he's saying when you were living in them. <clears throat> but now you also put all these aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and all abusive speech from your mouth. These are the sins of, of the human tongue. <laughs> and I, I think that the, the, the most difficult sins and the most habitual sins that we fall into, the easiest sins that always get us is the sins of the mouth. Amen. Yeah. I mean, other kinds of sins, you have to, like, scheme and plan. <laughs> you know, you have to think about it. But the sins of the mouth, I find so often times things coming out of my mouth, it's like it's the most unruly member of your body. <laughs> There's a, there's a saying that you need to engage your brain before you open your mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> if Paul heard that, he'd probably quote you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
sins often comes with verbalization. And then Paul goes on, do not lie to one another. Again, the tongue. Since you laid aside, and this is really interesting, the old self. What's the old self? It's the flesh. It's the soul that was oriented to the desires of the body. So that's the old self. That old self died in baptism with Christ, with its evil practices. And you have put on the new self. What's the new self? The new self was the spirit that was given to you and regenerated your heart in baptism. And oftentimes, you find that your spiritual battle is happening within yourself. It is the battle between the old self and the new self. So we are in, we're constantly engaged. And don't you feel like sometimes you're two people inside of you? I, I, I used to say, I was wrestling with the devil, and then I realized it was myself. <laughs> I was wrestling with myself. Okay, so we have received a new self, the true self, rather than the false self that we, in our natural condition, would live out our lives. The old self is narcissistic. The new self is the new life of giving ourselves to God and one another. <clears throat> and you'll put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. And who's the one who has created us through which God created us? Christ. Christ. We are being conformed to the <clears throat> image of Christ. <clears throat> a renewal in which there is no longer, look at this, this is radical, especially in the first century. Yeah. This new self is a new race of human beings. This is a new race of homo sapien. A new rule which is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free man, but Christ is all and in all. Scythian, what is that? Um, I'm glad you asked that. Um, you know who the Greeks are. You know who the Jews are. Circumcised and uncircumcised. Barbarian would be all foreigners that were uh, the Greeks use that to refer to everybody uh, who did not speak Greek, but also all those who they considered inferior. Uh, Scythian, uh, we don't really know who the Scythians were, but they come from Eastern Europe, oh. and they invaded or migrated. I should rather say invaded. Uh, they migrated into, uh, into and settled in, they had settlements in the Turkish, what is now the Turkish oh. Peninsula, where Colossae is. You see, there was a Scythian minority and Scythian communities in the like this River Valley. The majority were still Greeks, but there was these migrants oh. that had come in. So he, and there was prejudice against the Scythians. And so Paul is saying uh, to, to Col the Colossians would have known what that meant. It, it, it'd be like making references to all the ethnic peoples that we're in contact with. That's one of the reasons uh, I really, uh, this is just, uh, many churches have this, but one of the things I love about St. Matthew's is we have a diversity. So if I was writing, or if Paul was writing St. Matthew's, um, he would say, uh, we are no longer Hispanic and Anglo, Filipino, or Italian, <laughs> you know, because we are a mixed group here at St. Matthew's, and, but we are one people. Right. We're Christians. So all these other distinctions are not important. They belong to the world, a world which is passing away. But put on then, oh, this is the most, this is Paul at his finest in his pastoral advice. He's given us the negative picture. Now he's going to give us a positive picture of what life in the Christian community should look like, starting with verse 12. This is what life should look like at St. Matthew's. This is what life should look like at St. Justin Martyr. This is, at every Christian community, this is what it should look like, Paul's saying. Put on then as God's chosen ones, because we did not choose him, he chose us, remember? Holy, which means saintly, sanctified, set apart for God. And that happened through baptism. And we are beloved. We are the beloved ones of God. So put on, because we have this identity and we are, because we're holy, not because we made ourselves holy, God did, and because we are the objects of God's love, then we should put on these kinds of practices. 
Heartfelt compassion is right at the front. Our first response to anyone always should be heartfelt compassion. So when the marginalized one comes into our midst, or the gay person comes into our midst, or the homeless person, or the mentally ill person, or the person with a psychological disorder, how do we receive them? With heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These, Paul in the letter to the Galatians, refers to them as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't be this way by yourself. You need the Holy Spirit in order to be a compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient person. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Now look here, bearing with one another, doesn't that sound very nice? Oh, bearing with one another. You know what he's really saying? In the, in, in the Greek, it is very, very, it's very plain spoken Greek right here. Paul is speaking right at, at our level, street level here. He's saying, put up with each other's faults. Yeah. I was, uh, there's another word we use. Yeah. You know? Be merciful to each other. Um, when we see a, a weaker brother or sister who has a lot of issues and problems, we're to treat them with what? Love. Compassion. 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 We put up with it. We tolerate. We live with it. You live we help it. them along. Yeah. yeah. Live with it. That's well said. Yeah. You don't come to church to avoid those unpleasant people. You come to church to learn how to bear with them. That's how we grow. And forgiving one another. So Paul is presuming that in Christian community, we're going to offend each other. <laughs> so we got to forgive each other. It's simple as that. Forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, if you have a grievance or you take offense, and we so easily take offense, Paul, but if we do take offense and have a grievance against someone, here's what Paul says. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must do so as well, or you also must do, or you must. So must you also do. So what we see here is that here is the standard. To what extent do I forgive my brother who offends me or irritates me? The same way God has forgiven you. And how many times have you offended God this past year? How many times have you offended God today? Let me count the ways. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it's really beautiful pastoral direction he's given. If we could really live like this, we would be a light to the world. If we could be this kind of people. And we can't do this apart from the Holy Spirit. I'm saying this because next Sunday is Pentecost. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for uh, more of the Holy Spirit. In this community and in all churches. It's what we need. And over all of these things that you do. Put on love. Why? Because it is. or Which is the bond of perfection. Love is is what glue is the glue that holds us together in perfect harmony as a Christian community. This is almost poetic of Paul. Isn't this a beautiful vision of what Christian community should be like? And then he goes on, let the peace of Christ control your hearts. Not your irritations or anger or your disappointments or your offenses, but let the peace of Christ control your hearts, not jealousy or strife. The peace into which you were also called in one body. Remember, there is one spirit, one body, one church, one God and Father of us all, and, you know, one baptism, you know that. Then he goes on to say, <clears throat> be thankful. Now, this is something I hear, I've heard from some new age teachers, and I, I totally agree with them. Have an attitude of gratitude. My mother always used to say, Michael, be thankful for what you have. That's right. Yeah. That she was preaching the gospel. Yes, yeah, she was. Yeah. That's what it is because we ought to be grateful for what we have rather than complain what we don't. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. What or who is the word of God? Christ. Right. Christ. Jesus is the word of God. 
Let Jesus dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another. Uh, so we, we are to be teachers to one another, and we're to help each other by admonishing one another. Admonishing is, is helping people to see the drawing and challenging them to, to take the higher road, to be their higher self, to listen to their better half. You know, when I, whenever you're like in conflict with someone, help bring that to their attention that you're drifting now back into the place of anger and egotism. Help one another along. Not by being critical, but by admonishment. Admonishment is done, it, it, it is correction in the right spirit, in the spirit of love. Not in a harsh, critical, um, disrespectful way that we usually find ourselves easily falling into. And then, what does Paul say? Sing, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with, and here it is again, thanksgiving or gratitude in your hearts to God. And of course, gratitude and thanksgiving is the name of the worship that we render to God, which we call Eucharist. It's Eucharistic. The highest prayer is the prayer of thanksgiving, and it's the Eucharistic prayer that we offer every Sunday when we gather together. And during that time, we sing songs, the response royal song. We sing hymns. We sing spiritual songs. Spiritual songs, by the way, would be songs that are sung in a language that is unknown. It's, um, the, uh, it's, it's related to glossolalia, the speaking in tongues, which was a oh. common practice in the early church, praying in the spirit. So it's related to that. With gratitude in your hearts for, to God. Um, um, praying in tongues was normative in the first and second century of the church. And then, it, and then it sort of disappeared when the church became more institutionalized. And then there was the Pentecostal revival. I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, that everything that goes on in the Pentecostal revival is good, but I, I'm just mentioning that it, praying in the spirit or praying in tongues was normative in the early church's experience. And that's what Paul's referring to there. And whatever you do, whether in, I'm mentioning the tongues, I'm being deliberate in that, because Pentecost is coming, and you're going to hear about that in the readings of Pentecost this Sunday. So when you hear in uh, the second reading this Sunday, where Paul speaks mm -hmm. of speaking in tongues, you already now have the inside line on what that means. It's, it's a prayer language. Okay. <clears throat> and whatever you do, whether it's in word or indeed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So if you can't attach the name of Jesus on your action, you better not do it. <laughs> well, my suspicion is that when we have others who are irritating us and you know bothering us and we're having a very, very difficult time doing the being patient and being forgiving and so on, that it's our ego that is, is the center of the hostility that we're feeling. It's not the new self, it's the old self um, screaming at us about whatever this other person is doing. Um, the new self is the one that can be forgiving and loving and compassionate and all these other things. Um, it's yeah. the old self that is snarling about how arrogant this person is being or how uh, unrealistic this person is being or how whatever this person is being. I, I was, and and, and yeah. I also think that if you feel like you're on the receiving end of, of what somebody else has done or what they've said about you, that it's not your new self that is snarling inside it's a bruised ego that's snarling inside yeah that's right and that's a type of narcissism and that's the old self that paul's referring to i heard it said and i wish i could remember who said this it was a spiritual writer that i read recently i'll try to remember to give it to you later but this is a really important thing that the one who takes offense does more damage than the one who committed the, the offense. offense to begin with. 
Say that again. The one who takes offense right. oh, okay. oftentimes creates or creates more damage than the one who actually did the first who actually offended. I find that if somebody is verbally abusing you if you can, it's better to keep your mouth shut and walk away. Yes. Because all of a sudden you've got into a verbal war. Yeah. And I find with me, because I have a bad temper, just to shut my mouth and ignore it and walk away. It's the best thing you can't can. not always do that, but with me, I have to say, okay, don't say anything. Just yeah. let it go. And, and you're exercising, when you do that, you're exercising the virtue of gentleness. Oh, yeah. and, um, and there's a proverb in the Old Testament that a, a gentle <laughs> response turns away wrath. It stops it. I, I remember in a store, there was this customer, irate customer, who was just pouring out all this wrath on this poor clerk. And it wasn't the clerk's fault. It was just yeah. out of my hand. And I remember the clerk just saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, being calm, yes, sir, gentle. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the guy became self-aware that he was making a fool of himself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and of course, there was a group of us standing around, yeah. you know, and we were all feeling sorry for the guy he was abusing. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like what you're saying. Walk away. Walk away. Shut your mouth. Sometimes That's, you can't do it. It's exactly right. It's tough sometimes. Now Paul is going to uh, give pastoral direction to households and families. And in this, he really reflects the culture in which he's in. But there are principles here that we can drive from it. So we don't have to literally and slavishly follow this advice. This is advice coming from a first century man. Bear that in mind. But the important thing are the principles that are present. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. <clears throat> and a lot of people interpret that this, and probably in the first century they understood it much this way, this idea that the woman should obey the husband and, 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 uh, and be submissive and all that kind of thing. Now, what is the principle? Um, there was a survey um, taken by someone some years ago, and the, the question was to mo the question was, what is it that you want most from your spouse? And women responded by saying, love. The majority of men responded, respect. Because the ma masculine psyche has a different need. Of course they want love, but the top one is to be respected. So when a wife respects her husband, it is a great expression of love. But men, uh, or women on the other hand, value being nurtured, cherished, and loved. And Paul's advice is directed in that way. In, in a way, but it should be mutual. Either way. But it was interesting that in that survey that most men, their felt need was to be respected because men feel so disrespected in life in society. So if they, could, if they receive respect, that's a very loving thing. Um, and women have, a, they'll verbalize, I wanna feel loved. So husbands, love your wives. There was a book years ago that was written, do yourself a favor and love your wife. <laughs> Hugs are good. Yeah. <laughs> so love your wives and do not be a bit embittered against them. Now, Paul was living in a, in a culture in which there was not equality. Even though the gospel already planted the seeds of equality, it still had to be worked out. And so my marriage looks very different than how my grandparents' marriage looked. And well, it should. And, and so my wife and I come to our marriage as equals and an equal partnership in which we negotiate with one another as equals. But it wasn't that way um, in my father's house or in my grandfather's house. It was different. But I have to say that my mother and my grandmother respected their husbands and their husbands loved them. They followed that old model, but now we have to adapt to, um, we don't believe women are intrinsically inferior to men. Yeah, yeah. Is there any, as far as you know, any discussion about whether or not these um, admonitions and principles, moral principles in effect, 
um, are Paul's <coughs> actual writing or whether this has been um, put into the text by a later writer? Um, the yeah. shift did seem a big shift. Yeah. It's, I mean, what he wrote before, and then all of a sudden, husbands respect your wives. It, it, it seems like a, kind of a big shift. Yeah, that's um, why, well, I'm asking. Well, I mean, I, I, we know in, the, the, in some texts yeah. that, that we can Interpolations, see that in, yeah. yeah. Interpolations. In, in, in this particular case, no, I, I've never read anything like this. I believe this is Paul. What Paul usually does is he's, he's, he, he counsels. This is pastoral counseling. He's counseling of them to preserve what he, they believed the nature world was the natural order of things. Do it well. Um, I, I think that they were still working out in the first century the implications of Jesus' attitude of radical egalitarianism. And the church started out being much more egalitarian, but then it became hierarchical because fam all society was hierarchical. So Paul is living in a cultural world like this, and what he's saying is, husbands, don't be abusive. Love your wives and wives, you know, respect your husbands. He, he's looking to preserve decency and order as he understood it. Um, Paul was not a modern. He just wasn't. Even though he at times would rise above it when he said, in Christ there's neither male or female. That's an egalitarian statement. But to presume that Paul had to work that out in all of its practical implications is, is really demanding a lot from him. It would take 2,000 years for us to do, for Christianity to come to the realization that women are equal to men. And still you have men in the church resisting it. You even still have some women resisting it. Um, what do you think? It's pretty simple, but reading it just the way it is, it, it, even back then they should have love your wives. That's pretty simple to understand. Yeah. But it does seem to subordinate women to men. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to about 20 years of homilies at my Roman Catholic parish, where I knew the homilist was having a hard time um, Explaining what the gospel just was read. Yeah. Because they did, they knew that there was not something that people were wanted to hear. Yeah. And the explanation I kept hearing was that this, you know, we need to look at, 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 at it differently. There was this concept that the church is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, when, they, when it's saying, um, wives give way to your husbands, it's all of us as the church being respect subservient to Christ. Yeah. And I, I mean, I heard this a couple of times presented in different ways. Have you ever heard that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always came away with nice try, <laughs> but yeah. it is not. That's just not. I I, I would have said. If I was a homeless, I would have said what you said. Paul is writing in the first century. Yeah. And, and he's, he's trying to be, he's trying to create a good, Paul, whoever wrote this, he was trying to say that your family relationship, not the relationship with the church, the family relationship should be of respect and love. Yeah. And it would be too hard to say everybody's equal. You can't, couldn't say that in the first century. And, and it may not fully occur to him what that would have meant in family life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it was one of those things. Whenever I saw, and, and you know, I, I used to, used to be a lecturer, so I would see this. And this is going to be the reading. I'm going, oh, here we go again. Oh. You know, <laughs> how are you going to read this? And on, always the homeless tried to explain it away. Try to say it doesn't really mean what you think it means. He was talking about this this concept of the bride of Christ and stuff. 
I think if he was talking about the church, he would have said he was talking about the church because he talks about yeah. the body of church. We try to yeah. spiritualize it. Yeah. Well, right. And, you yeah. know, and we realize this is a letter to the Christians in Colossae. I don't think they were thinking in terms of the body of the church, the bride of Christ, and all this. Something that got an overlay that something, or somehow, you know, I mean, maybe in the seminary, there's probably a class on. Okay, in Paul and the Colossians, you got a problem with the reading, and here's some approaches to it. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know, but it was, it oh, was yeah. always yeah. left a lot of us with like, you know, why don't you just deal with it? That's a, a silly explanation. Yeah. It does not resonate with people with ears. It's, it's a real stretch. Oh, and, stretch. Yeah, it's, it, and then we're trying to impose our modern sensitivities on a first-century writer, and that, why, why we, do, that's an injustice to Paul. Also, Paul is not the standard of absolute truth here. He never sets himself up to be that. I mean, he's a man of conviction, and he has great moments of theological insight. I'll put it this way. The seeds of human equality between the genders were already planted by Jesus. And it took generations of people for those seeds to bear fruit, and we're seeing it in our time. But the whole women's equality movement is really the fruit of those seeds that Christ planted a long time ago, because isn't it interesting, the women's movement and the women's equality movement comes out of Christian culture. It doesn't come from anywhere else in the world. You know? And uh, even communism, which believed in equality, the communist ideal is a Christian ideal. They got it from the Christians. This is just their methodology were terrifying, <laughs> you know. It's, it's, uh, but uh, the idea of equality was planted by Jesus, but it took generations for us to, to realize that. And Paul had moments of clarity of thought. And I quoted that, in Christ there's neither male or female. And Paul had women missionary companions that he respected. Remember when we read the 16th chapter of Romans and he had all these women there he was greeting and honoring who were leaders of the church? But that didn't last long. The church went back to the old patriarchal model. The, the, the cultural pressure was too much. And it really took the 20th century for us to, you know, with women's suffrage and, it, and, 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 the, and then later the, um, the women's rights movement and, the, um, and that sort of thing. And we still have resistance. So it, it, these things take time. The fact that you were not a housewife and you were a university professor two generations ago, that would have been really, really, maybe next to impossible. Do you think that's true? I do. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Or my, my parents, especially my mother, thought that my life was over because I didn't marry. Oh. She, I was supposed to get married so that I would have a man to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Your sister yeah. Mary? My sister married and divorced. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> oh. Um. Well, it wasn't that many generations. My, my grandparents sent their daughters to university. That was very unusual. Yeah. That was very unusual. So. My mother-in-law is a graduate of UCLA, and she worked for the uh, State Department sort of thing. She didn't marry. She married later in life, like most women are doing today. She was a liberated woman, an educated woman, but she was rare at her time. Mm -hmm. What amazes me is that when you go back to the Gospels and you see the encounters that Jesus, that get recorded, that Jesus had with women, mm -hmm. there is so much um, respect and uh, honoring of women that goes on in those stories and even the account of the women being the first witnesses to the resurrection and that the, the men didn't believe them. But back in those days, a woman could not be a witness in a court of law at all. You know, so, so in those stories, for the women to be the ones who are called as the first witnesses, I mean, to me, that's just mind-boggling. There's so much that goes on in those stories. Um, it's a, it's a wonder to me that the people that wrote the Gospels even put that stuff in, given 
what was mm -hmm. going on in the first century and how women were not regarded in any sense whatsoever as equal. Yeah, for the story of the woman at the well. Yes. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's and, and these yeah. stories are counterintuitive for the time. Oh, more, yeah. And there's a real consistency in Jesus' behavior. He treated women as equals. It, 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 it's, it's just there. There's, it's undeniable. <clears throat> but trying to, it's always a challenge to try to fully implement the teachings and principles of Jesus in community. You gotta have order in the community. People are, you know, gotta take into consideration cultural custom and all of that. And so Paul is living in that tension. Then he goes on to children, verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things. I wish my son was here. <laughs> For this is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children or provoke your children. Could be translated that so that they will not lose heart. What's it say in your translation? Um, verse 21. Parents, never drive your children to resentment or you will make them feel frustrated. Yeah. That captures the, the it's intent. A, but it's parents. But interesting, they changed it. it. They got rid of, they, 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 uh, in, they, rather than just saying fathers, they're, they're parents. Yeah. What's it, the, it, what, in, in the Greek, it's fathers. What's 320? What, read that one. Children. Children. Be obedient to your parents always, because that is what will please the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Then parents never drive your children to resentment, or you make them feel frustrated. Now, the next verse is one where I really have problems with Paul. Oh, yeah. And he has left some. Yeah, here's a cultural thing. You can try to, you can give some sort of esoteric theological interpretation about Christ and the bride of Christ for the family relations, but now he gets into social relations. Slaves and all things above the, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with mere external service only as those who please men, but with sincerity of heart. Fearing the Lord. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a toughie. Because we see slavery now because we have the benefit of hindsight. It is a great social injustice. But in the time of Paul and in almost every culture and society yeah. in the world, the whole human economy, right. the whole human uh, civilizing enterprise was utterly and completely dependent upon slavery. They couldn't think beyond that. Well, in 1861, in the United States, yeah. there, were, there were an enormous number of people yeah. who used Paul's words to justify exactly. their economic system well, and justify the Civil War. One of the things that um, I think that is interesting to me, because I thought about this, nowadays, when you think of Protestant fundamentalists, who are the first groups that come to mind? Baptists. You think Baptists are fundamentalists? Mm -hmm. And evangelicals. There was an evangelical now, church in What South part Carolina. of the country do you see these people coming from? South. The South. The Baptist church um, in the United States was a huge denomination. Yeah. In 1850, it split in half between the North and the South. Ten years before the Civil War, and you had the Southern Baptists, yeah, and you had the right. Northern Baptists. The Northern Baptists were the abolitionists. I know because that's what my family, we were Northern Baptists. And the Southern Baptists um, um, were the ones who justified slavery by quoting texts like this. They would say slavery is divinely instituted by God. The slaves are better off being Enslaved. Slavery. They're too simple. They're inferior. And besides, the whole southern economy was built upon slavery. So they resisted. So the Baptists in the South would practice literal interpretation to justify slavery. The Northern Baptists could not quote any Bible verse that really directly condemned slavery. They had to use a process of theological development. And they were accused of being too progressive, not taking the Bible seriously. No, they would say the Bible needs to be interpreted, but not literally. 
The social gospel of the late 19th century, that is the gospel, the social gospel came from the American, or the Northern Baptists. It spread to other Northern denominations. It came out at the same time that social justice teaching of the Roman Catholic Church came out, early 20th century, late 19th century. It's about, you know, raising them up. This is why fundamentalism took hold in the South. They were interpreting the Bible literally to justify slavery. And as a result, even though slavery, lost, they lost that argument. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1980s that the Southern Baptist denomination apologized for upholding slavery. Mm -hmm. That took that long. Well, <clears throat> the Southern Baptists became fundamentalists because they, they inherited that tradition of inter interpreting these texts in a very crudely literalistic way. And, and they, 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 what they do is they, they, they depend on the letter rather than on the spirit. Now Paul, in spirit, is not endorsing slavery. He's just living in a cultural world where that, he couldn't think beyond out of that box. So what he is giving us, if you're in a place where you're working for someone else, that's the principle. Yeah, the boss. Okay. Yeah. Now we can say, okay, we're in a different economic system. And, but the thing is, if you're going to work for somebody, you have an employer, then work, do your job. Don't just be working when he's around. Work hard from the heart all the time. And, and, and look past your employer and see yourself as working for Christ in all that you do. If every worker went to work to go to please Jesus, they would be turning out pretty good work. Now you were an employer, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> you know? You had employee, employees that really worked hard for you and you respect that person. And you had employees that would just, you know, yeah. you, you see the difference, you know? Yeah. So we, we, we can apply the principle here. If, you're, if you are working for another person, this time I'm a wage earner, then do it as unto the, unto the Lord. So let your work always be done with excellence. But um, I don't think, it, they, they lost that battle, the fundamentalists, uh, trying to uphold slavery. We now know it's a moral evil, and I think Paul would agree, because remember, Paul had a shining moment. In Christ, there's neither male nor female, or slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Then, <clears throat> whatever you do, Verse 23, do from your heart as unto the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So when you're serving your employer, you're, you're serving Christ. Have that attitude. For the one who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong. Remember we talked about wrath, which that one has done, and that without partiality. It's not nothing personal. It's just the way it's going to be. The consequences will come. So uh, next week we'll pick up on chapter 4. Any other insights or thoughts about what we just read of Paul? You should, should almost read this every day. Yeah. That, especially about how, that, that, how to live in community. I, I really think that the, the, the verses I love most is verses 12 through 17. Yeah. Yeah. That should be how St. Matthew should run. It's really, it's how every family should run. I love 12. Yeah. You love that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Read that again. Uh, put, that put on again. then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. My mother used to say, Michael, have patience. Have patience, Michael. Now, I, I wanted to remind you before we close that we, uh, tomorrow evening is the beginning of our Holy Spirit conference. And you may, and the conference is a two-day conference. There are workshops all day on Friday, workshops on, on, on um, Saturday all day. The conference, for, if you're gonna come to the whole thing, we ask for a $31 donation, because I gotta pay the speakers. I got some good people. And it's ecumenical, so we have people from different denominations, but we're all talking about what is the Holy Spirit, and, or who is the Holy Spirit, and how do we relate to the Holy Spirit. It's for Pentecost leading up to it. Um, however, if you want to come, if you can't come tomorrow for the workshops and you only can come on Saturday, then it's only $16. I'm asking for a donation. However, if you can only come in the evenings, 
tomorrow night, Friday night, and Saturday night, we, those evening sessions, you don't have to pay anything, although I pass an offering basket. Right, right. <laughs> I gotta pay for the conference. What time are you starting Friday? Uh, fr Friday, it starts at 10. Okay. Well, you got come at nine, between nine and 10 for this registration, but if you can come oh, okay. at 10, Catherine will be here to register you. Oh no, yeah, come at 10 and you'll be registered. Um, if you want to come to the workshops, or if you come tomorrow evening, come at 6, but the actual service starts at 7, and we have great music tomorrow, and we have a great keynote speaker, okay. a woman, and she's really good, and um, she comes from the same denomination that Amy Semple McPherson founded, a woman. Have you heard of the Foursquare Gospel people? Four Four yeah, starting here in Los Angeles. So because I, I support women's equality and I support women's ordination. <laughs> I wanted to highlight, see the Holy Spirit speaks to her. Then uh, Friday night, we had, uh, if you can come Friday evening at seven o'clock, we have um, a scholar from, uh, that we know well, Mike McNichol. He's a scholar from Fuller Theological Seminary. He'll be our keynote speaker. We'll have good music there because it's my wife. <laughs> yeah. Then on Saturday night at seven o'clock, I will be giving know message and uh, and the St. Matthew, Matthew's musician will be providing the music so it's it's a time of inspiration oh so, and, and you're welcome to come to the any or all of the whole conference um, I have a flyer I, I want I give this out to everybody but this, oh, yeah, this, I, I'll have. give it to you we have a flyer in the moment tell you a little bit of what it's about. But it starts tomorrow, registration at six, uh, but if you're just coming for the evening, just come at seven. And then we have it, uh, and you can register anytime you're here if you wanted to register. The evening sessions, you don't have to register, but if you want to do the workshops, and the reason I'm collecting do that, that donation is so I can pay my speakers. So, so we could come just on Friday, if we. And you can just you can do any or all of it, however it works for you. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, His so, birthday party on Saturday. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard, but. Uh, okay, well. He's fine. Jim's going. He's fine. And you want to mention any intentions you would like to offer up as we pray? My brother and Roy, my brother-in-law Roy Hall, who's having some heart problems right now, pray for his recovery. Yes. And that my husband's heart um, behaves. Amen. His name's Michael. Michael. Okay. For candy. For candy. And for this conference, that the Holy Spirit will be moving and working within the hearts of all who come, that we may learn more about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And for all our unmentioned intentions, we offer them as we pray. O oh, loving God, we give you thanks. We know that you are ever faithful to your promises, and you call us to be one with your Son, Jesus, and thereby be united in holy union with you. Take the words that we have heard tonight of St. Paul and hide them within our hearts. May it inform all of our actions. May we always be filled with that compassionate love for others. And we offer this prayer with all these intentions as we pray in the way Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
We belong to you, O Lord of our longing. We belong to you. In our daily living, dying and rising, we belong to you. We belong to you, O Lord of our longing. We belong to you. In our daily